Today I want to talk about what I believe to be one of the most interesting and most important guitars in the instrument's history. Um, quite a big claim I suppose, but I'm sticking with it. Today we're going to check out the Gibson Les Paul Jr. Hey guys, welcome back to Ditswitch Demos. My name is Jackson and that's right, today I want to talk about the Gibson Les Paul Jr. A guitar that's been with me for quite a few years. Um, I have quite a deep love for this instrument and this design. Um, growing up, sort of my mid-teens, I was big into modern American punk, I suppose you call it, Green Day. Gaslight Anthem was a big one for me as well, and this guitar uh, became quite iconic for me. Also around that time, 14, 15, 16, I uh, started singing and playing guitar in a rock band at school, and uh, I kind of wanted a guitar that was just straight up go, almost like just a gas pedal if you know what I mean, um, and this guitar fulfilled that need. Uh, wholeheartedly. Simple as this guitar may seem, uh, you know, you've got your one P90 and just a couple of controls, um, this guitar is surprisingly versatile. It also has a really deep history in my opinion. Uh, we're going to explore both of those things today in this video. Let's get started. First, a little history lesson on the Gibson Les Paul Jr. It was originally released into Gibson's lineup in 1954 as a more affordable, simpler version of their standard Les Paul. Aimed at beginners and students, this was about half the price of the standard Les Paul at the time. If you think in mid-50s, a standard Les Paul was about $250, and these came in at around $120, so quite a big price difference, but also how crazy is it to think about those prices now, especially as mid 50s and late 50s, especially Gibson Les Pauls now go for well into the six figures. That's pretty crazy to think about. Originally released as a single cut in 54, then later in 58 it came out as the double cut, which you will have seen around as well, and then it changed into the SG shape in 61 and then was completely discontinued in 63. So, a relatively short lifespan for the Les Paul Jr., but then it did come back later on in a few reissues. Throughout those shape changes, the core and heart of the guitar remained relatively the same. Uh, we have a slab mahogany body, a single P90 in the bridge, wraparound tailpiece, which was actually originally just the stop tail on a Les Paul uh, bridge. Then we have a master volume and a master tone. <laughs> I do think, I'm going to put this out there, that they, these guitars are probably one of the most harmoniously designed guitars out there. I put it up with the Telecaster in that sense. Really are greater than the sum of its parts. Um, it really feels like every part of this guitar comes together and acts as one in a way. It feels like an instrument instead of a collection of parts, if you know what I mean. Everything vibrates and r resonates together. It really works as a whole, if you know what I mean, and I love that about this thing. Once you spend some time with these guitars as well, you start to realise that there isn't really much that these can't do. Yes, I suppose it drives you down a certain path tonally and playing style wise, but really there's not much this can't do, all the way from blues to rock to punk obviously, but also funk players have used these in the past as well. I think these are really versatile guitars and pickups. The P90 gives you all that grunt and bark that you need for any rock situation, but also has 
a sparkle and a delicacy that you don't get from humbuckers, for example. Paired with the master tone and volume that you've got on the bottom here, you've got a wide palette of tones you really do. All the way to full on max, maxed out balls to the wall rock, you know, wind it back a little bit, both the tone and the volume, you can get a really nice, almost acoustic airiness to the sound. Or roll the tone all the way off and you can almost get like a faux neck pickup lead sound. It really can do a lot of stuff. So we'll go through some tones as well right now. I have the guitar going straight into my amp with no pedals engaged at the moment. Um, Victory is set up pretty much as always, just uh, clean with a little bit of reverb. However, as you'll hear shortly, the guitar is pushing it into a nice bit of drive. Even though it's not a super hot pickup, just the grunt and the bark of the pickup is pushing the amp into a really nice place. <laughs> bit of overdrive on. I've actually just got the blues driver on here, the Boss Wazza blues driver. Uh, really enjoying it at the moment and it sounds great with this guitar. This is what it sounds like. <laughs> I think you can hear there that it's still got a warmth to it, even though it's quite aggressive sounding, it's still got that warmth that is really, really nice. I didn't think this through, did I? I'm, I'm changing stuff on the volume and tone, but I didn't set the camera angle to show that. Right, But right then I was rolling down both the volume and the tone just a little bit, and you can hear it drastically changes the tone. Like I said, it almost gives it an acoustic airiness, which is really, really nice. Let's put a bit of fuzz on, I think, and this is where you can really hear sort of the faux neck pickup sounds going on. This is the Beatronics Royal Jelly. Uh, everything on full on the guitar. <laughs> Now if I roll the tone all the way down. Let's talk a little bit about the colours of the Les Paul Jr. because I think this is a really interesting story as well. Originally released just in sunburst, sort of a yellow to black sunburst. Uh, later came the famous cherry red and the TV model or the TV yellow. The yellow is the one that's really interesting to me and personally I love this colour even though this particular one is slightly more opaque and mustardy than what they would have been in the 50s. There's a few different stories around where this colour came from. Originally it was called limed oak or limed mahogany I think and then later changed to the TV. And like I said there's a few different stories of where this came from. I, I guess arguably one of the most famous stories about this colour is that it was introduced to avoid glare on black and white TV so this guitar appeared white on TV. I've heard that from a few sources but I've also heard that it was just a modern name and modern colour to promote Les Paul's TV show with Mary Ford I think it was called the Les Paul and Mary Ford show or something like that if you want proof of the versatility of this guitar all you have to do is look at the sort of various players who've uh, taken this guitar as their instrument of choice over the years I guess this guitar originally blew up and became iconic because of the New York Dolls and Johnny Thunders and he's actually famous for saying or the other guitar player in New York Dolls maybe but one of them is famous for saying that they wanted a guitar that was almost like an automatic transmission just a guitar where you focused on the playing you know didn't worry about switching stuff out and that's one of my favorite things about this guitar too. It's just almost like I said at the beginning of the video, like just a gas pedal, an automatic transmission guitar. Other famous players, 
you know, where do we start? We've got Leslie West, very famous for using a Les Paul Jr. Glenn Frey of Eagles, also very famous for using one of these. Uh, John Lennon also took one of these as the, his main guitar. It was slightly modded, admittedly, but after the Beatles, he used pretty much one of these exclusively. But for me, personally, it's more about the modern players who took up this guitar, like Billy Joe Armstrong of Green Day and Brian Fallon of the Gaslight Anthem. Those were the two big guys for me who inspired me to pick up one of these and I've never looked back since. <laughs> So let's talk a little bit about my model. Um, really, there's not too much special about this. This was a standard uh, Les Paul Jr. model that came out in 2011. I think they did a, a short run of them in 2011 and then reintroduced them a couple years later. But in 2011, these were really affordable. Um, I think this was about 450 pounds, which is, if you think about it, is for, you know, made in the USA Gibson is not bad at all. I do think I got pretty lucky with this model. I went to a few shops and played a few of the same era and they were just all okay. And then for some reason I just decided to order one from the internet and it arrived and it was a peach. This one is so light and resonant. It feels great. It barely ever needs setting up as well. It's super solid. This is actually one of the only guitars I own that I've never changed anything on. It has a reasonably chunky neck like those, uh, I guess in the 50s they would have called them baseball bat necks. This one probably has closer to a 60s neck. It's a little slimmer, but still plenty in the hand. Um, but really what it's about for me is about that pickup. It's still got all that P90 grunt, but still that sparkle and loveliness that I just love about this pickup. So why do I think you should get one or something similar? We'll get into that in a second. Um, I think that this is, like I said before, this is the definition of greater than the sum of its parts. I would put this design up there with the Telecaster in that way. You know, the Telecaster again is a very simple guitar but can do so much. I've always preferred the Les Paul Jr. over the standard Les Paul as well. This, this has just got such a great mojo about it and I think to not have one, if you're a guitar collector especially, to not have a single P90 guitar in your arsenal you know, you've got to do it, man. You've really got to do it. Controversially, it's uh, Gibson aren't in the best place at the moment in history. You know, they, they, they've done some questionable things over the last couple of months and few years. And some of you maybe out there want to avoid buying a new Gibson, which is why I've put together a list of some alternatives at different budgets of single P90 guitars, relatively simple guitars that you might want to check out if you're in the market for something like this. So for under £200, I really don't think you can go wrong with a Harley Benton Jr. They do a double cut and a single cut, and they're coming at about £180. 
a great place to start off if you wanted to start modding it or just kind of get a beginner guitar that'd be a really awesome choice and then the next budget I've put under a thousand pounds I've put a few in here this is the kind of the biggest uh, section the Reverend Sensei Junior these are meant to be great guitars set up beautifully straight out the box 649 pounds can't go wrong then one of my favorites we have the Revolta Combinato 1 again 599 pounds this is probably the one I check out after, out of these ones. I almost bought one of these myself. I think these are really, really cool. And then a buddy of mine makes single pickup guitars all the time. You might have to especially request a P90, but Fidelity Guitars from the UK um, has a light series of guitars and they're all simpler stripped down guitars with one pickup. And I'm sure if you asked nicely, he'd put a P90 in the bridge for you. Um, they come in at 899 And then the next category I've got here is under £2,000. Two guitars in this category. Um, we have the Eastman SB55. This is a beautiful looking guitar. Um, these are 1239 so still pretty affordable uh, for what you're getting, I would say. Um, beautiful relicking on this one. Eastman make great guitars as well. That's You know that's going to be a good one. Also, similar sort of thing, we have the Maybach Lester Jr. They also do the SG shape with a single P90. I've played a few Maybachs at 42 Gear Street and all of them were pretty flawless. This one comes in at £13.99. And now we're going to move on to the high-end guitars, I guess you could say, the 2000 Plus. Um, first of all, we have the Rock and Roll Relics Thunder, aptly named after Johnny Thunders, I suppose. Um, so many options with this one as well. I think it pretty much only comes in uh, double cut though, uh, but you're looking at spending £2,400 plus on that. One of my favourites on the whole list will be the new Novo Solus M1. Uh, slightly f uh, further removed from the, from the kind of classic design, but still has that heart of a Les Paul Jr. in it. You can look at spending upwards of £3,000 on one of those, um, but that would be a special, special instrument. The most expensive on this list, I have written down the Collings 290, and you're looking at spending upwards of 4000 quid on one of those. Hefty, hefty money, if you ask me. And then finally, I've written down one made right here in the UK. Um, we have the Iveson uh, 59DC. But what is really interesting about this one is he, almost, he also does the Fillmore model, which is a take on one of the, um, oh, what is it? It's an Epiphone model. I can't remember the exact name, but again, it's just another take on that single P90 guitar. And that Fillmore looks sweet. Um, you're probably looking at spending about two and a half thousand on one of those. So those are the kind of ones I've written down on different budgets if you wanted to get something other than a Gibson, which I totally understand. But if you wanted to go for a proper vintage one, I found one at Nashville, in Nashville at Carter's Vintage Guitars. It is a vintage 61 double cut in cherry red, and it's beautiful, and that is $7,000. A lot of money, um, like a hell of a lot of money, but when you consider how much sort of a 61 Les Paul standard would cost you, or Fender, the equivalent Fender, you know, that's a lot of money, it would be a lot more money. Um, so maybe $7,000 is reasonable. I just love checking out guitars like that and I think that's really, really cool. So that pretty much covers my thoughts on the Les Paul Jr. One of my favorite guitars of all time. I bloody love this thing and this design. Um, this guitar, this one that I own, I will never get rid of. It's one of those ones that will be with me till the end. Um, and hopefully it looks a lot more relic than it does right now when you know that day does come. Thank you very much for watching. If you like what you saw, please subscribe and go check out some more videos. Also, there's some links below if you want to support me and the channel more, like Patreon, PayPal, and Bandcamp. Really appreciate the extra support. And yeah, I'll see you in the next one, guys. Cheers. Mm -hmm.